tonight. We pray for those who may be watching by the way of the stream. We, we just pray tonight things go well and that we can hear each other uh, in the sense that they can be with us in this class. And the visuals, we pray they'll work as well. Thank you, Brother Paul, and those who have helped us get this set up tonight. And then we pray for those in the class. Lord, some are burdened. Uh, some, Lord, have special needs that only you can meet. And so we plead your blood over them and pray your will and your way to be just number one in our lives. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Okay, so tonight, I don't start off with, there are two, I think there's a handout from last week. If you don't have it, you can pick it up. It's got last week's date on it. And then there is a handout for tonight, which I just minimized. And I need to go, I hope I can make this happen. I could not do this. I couldn't do this in the church on the screens there but uh let's see if this if you can what happened it did happen it happened okay all right you see where can, can you see that all right th this is straight from logo software and and the book on the screen is is our it, you'll see it right uh right here uh, the, un, the Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. Now, that is this book. Okay, we're working. Okay, that's this book. Now, that's not your textbook unless you bought it. This is, but I wanted, I wanted to, um, I was doing some work today, and this is divided in parts. And the reason I like it, I can't do it with the study you have. But the same author and both books deal with the same subject matter. One is deeper than the other. If you, you notice there's a subject index. And these are all the subjects that are dealt with in this book. I mean, you, you look at this chart and you think this chart's busy? <laughs> you had not seen anything you get... In, in this book, with the biblical subjects, and that's just the part of one I want to show you. Now, if you, I was mentioning, El, see Elohim right here? I, I'm, uh, you see the cursor moving? And he also says, see, uh, uh, see also sons of God? Then you, and these are the page numbers, where I can go to those and, and, and get his, his commentary. Now, that's just on subject index. I can keep, keep going. The, the, these, I mean, it's just the topics dealt with in that one book. Now, having had you take this journey with me, can you understand now why it's taken me about two and a half years to go through this? When you run every reference? And then that's just on subjects. Now, here's a scripture index. Here's the book of Genesis. I mean, you look at look at all the Bible. Here's Exodus, Numbers, Judges, Second Samuel, Psalms. Here's when that we go back to Psalms. Well, it even includes Apocrypha, so you get Maccabees here, and and Job, and uh, well, if you if you go with me, here's Matthew. That's what we get to. All right, right here. When I was in college, Bible school, and graduate work, when it came to the Old Testament, I only had one professor who treated it in depth. All my other classes, and here was the premise. The Bible is a big book. And so our, the concentration of study I had was in the New Testament. Where there was linkage to the Old Testament, we often did. But again, it wasn't in depth. So much of 
highs and it's not saying you didn't read the Bible. You read the Bible, but there's a difference as you learn in the, in the class already or as we've been doing in Sunday school going through the book of Acts. There's a difference when you go through a chapter or a verse and when you go through and take it apart. If you can understand that, would you nod your head a little bit? My point is, all that takes time. And I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm not the smartest one in the room. The only thing that I can, can say I believe truthfully is that I have, since God called me, wanted to make myself available. And I've asked him for help. And so I just want you to see a little bit of the background. That's just the scripture index. And uh, so having shown you that, uh, I can go back up and, and here's where. The, the, I was doing Nephilim's before the flood, Nephilim's after the flood. Now, I've not given this to you yet, but we'll get there in time. But until we can get a foundation, I might create more questions and curiosity than I could answers. And two, you hadn't had time to read into the book yet. And the more you read into the book, much of what's going to be covered here is going to be answered when you get into the book. And, and, and that'll be a help. So having accomplished that goal, then uh, let, me, let me close this. And I believe, I believe we're ready to Go. Let's go here. Anybody following what's taking place in our communities, in our country? I mean, I didn't even turn the TV on today because I knew my blood pressure would go up. Last Friday there was a conference call. I, I, I got to get the right to name down this this council, this, the White House that they're calling the pastors. And they had prepared us for what would happen uh, with with uh, the hearing today. And uh, did you know that the media? Well, wait, let's rephrase that. I, I'm on stream too. I might get locked up. Select Democrats and one of the networks. I won't say it on there. One of the networks rehearsed that demonstration that went on in Washington today. They did it last night. They rehearsed it. They practiced how they could destroy it. Now, if, if, if we don't have enough sense, now I know we grew up in happy days, most of us, that we think everything's going to be all right. This midterm in November is going to be bigger than the election in 16. Because if they can get majorities, if it's in the House, nothing's going to go. Nothing. And then once they can find a little bit of power, it's going to be one executive order after another executive order. And already, already, the... That, that, there's a difference. I, I don't know if Republicans practice or not, but they they send out these memos. Have you ever noticed when you get one in front of a microphone and a camera, and then you line ten up behind them, and they can be from all of the United States, they all say the same thing. That's called the reading that same book. Well, they publish their books, and at the top of the hit list are conservative, Bible-believing Christians. And, 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 and we've been, there's an article this week that uh, SBC, I think they're in, in, in this past year has been a year decline that's gone back 17 years. Less baptisms and so forth. Now, we're, we're falling away. If you can't understand that, we're, we're really in trouble. But I think too many of us want to coast coast on what we did 10 years ago. And I believe as long as God, as God leaves us here, He got a purpose for us. And if we can't do anything else, we can pray. And that's the purpose of that call they did Friday. 
was to get your people praying because this this isn't a done deal. It's not in the bag. In other words, there's opposition to everything they want to do. And if you don't believe putting the new judge on the bench will not cause even maybe blood in the streets because that crowd, they won't take it sitting down. Anyway, let's look at this. ABI tonight. Well, this is Arkansas. In fact, that's Little Rock, Arkansas. And there used to be a monument in Little Rock by, I forgot the geographical location. Some of you, if you've been in that area, you would, would maybe know where the Ten Commandments were. But the Ten Commandments have been destroyed. But they're putting Bethlehem, this satanic structure, sculpture, there right across from where the Ten Commandments used to be. And uh, if we can't, and there's an article not pertaining to the one with the picture, but there's an article that, uh, in the article, they're talking about the decline in church, you know, Bible-believing church, especially here in the Bible Belt, but at the same time, there's a rise in, in, in Satanism and the worship of the occult. It's more appealing to the young people. You see, everything, everything on the surface with the occult and, and Satanism is have it your way. You got free will to do what you want to. And then they say in church, all they want to tell you what you can't do. All the negatives. And that's been robbing our churches of young people for a long time. But the problem is we don't, we don't show who God is. And I hope to do that tonight as we do our study, that we can have a better understanding of, of who God is, why we're here, and what our future looks like. And it's bright and exciting. I put this up last week. This is a cave there in Siberia where they found the, the um, DNA to a hybrid. This is a, believed to have been a Nephilim. I, one... Uh, the Washington Post said it was 50,000 years old, and the New York Times said that it was 90,000 years old. But if you're a scientist, what's the difference in 40, 50,000 years? It doesn't matter. I mean, they throw numbers out, and the media never challenges it, and everybody accepts it. Uh, in the world we live in, they won't let us do that. We're held to a higher accountability. But they found this, this, this hybrid. Now, what's a hybrid? It's a cross between a non-human and a human. That article that I had up a moment ago, that chapter on the Nephilims before the flood, they, he deals in depth with the, the cross breeding between the two worlds and, and presents several, I think, pretty reasonable theories. Nobody really knows exactly how it happened, but he presents a pretty good case there. Now take your Bible and look with me in Revelation chapter 21. We're going to take a brief journey, and, and, this, and then we've got another journey. But I want you to look at this with me in Revelation 21. And uh, we're going to start with verse 1, and uh, we teach it, but not as I saw it, because this is what, uh, about 2 or 3 this morning, I heard a comment that had to do with the new heaven and the new earth, new Jerusalem, and it, it registered with me. But if you if you see uh, John in Revelation 21, he says, And I saw a new heaven, new earth, and the first heaven, the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And then verse 2 says, And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down, from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And we know the bride is referenced in Revelation as the bride of Christ. And I believe it's the church. And then verse 3 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be there what? Their God. Now here's a study that I'm, a journey I'm on, hadn't gotten there yet. <clears throat> I was shocked when I began to see 
the number of occurrences in Scripture where we have a visitation, a divine visitation between God and man. It started in the third chapter of Genesis. Uh, before the fall, you go back, second chapter, third chapter is the fall. God came down and walked with Adam and walked with Eve in the garden. And then sin came. In the third chapter, God comes down to walk in the garden and Adam and Eve are hiding. And that's when God says, Adam, where are you? And Adam says that he was naked. And God says, who told you? You were naked. See, God knew Adam sinned. He just wanted Adam to know Adam had sinned. And sometimes we think we can hide. Now, he was hiding his nakedness with, uh, if it's a fig leaf, Ron has shown us some fig leaves here in Israel that are big enough to be a covering. But we know that in that third chapter, that God is there with Adam and Eve. I don't know that anybody here would debate that. But if, if, we have to have an ending as God had before the sin, before the curse that was pronounced in the third chapter, then we're looking at the relationship we'll have with God as so did Adam and Eve. Now, I don't know about you, but that sure makes me want to smile. Uh, yesterday, a Sunday I did a lot of smiling. I was blown away. God knew I needed it. But we had a young man who God has his hand on. In fact, I heard someone who made the statement, and he's a musician, that he heard a lot of music. But he said, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone play with the anointing that Jacob Clutch had Sunday. And uh, you, you think about that sweet, sweet spirit that's there. A Sunday night I dealt with the fruits of the Spirit. And uh, you don't have to wonder when the Holy Spirit's there. Then you just overcome by the love of God. I mean, it, it just so you don't have to promote it. You don't have to announce it. You don't have to, 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 to do anything to bring it down when God's there. You know He's there. I mean, just imagine walking with God. Here, this verse says, look at it now. This is in Revelation 21, verse 3. Notice what He says. He, he says, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the tabernacle is dwelling of God, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Verse 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the, for, for the former things have what? Have passed away. And it, 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 we're looking at the intimacy of the moment when we see God. Just for a moment, imagine it when we see God. And then can you think of anything to compare to it? I mean, you can just multiply multiple, multiple times every other experience we have. He goes on in verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things, what's this word? New. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So I believe all the Bible is true and faithful. Verse 6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life, and I'll give it what? Freely. Now, what is that? What is this fountain of water, this fountain of the water of life? Well, the handout that I gave you is going to go into depth in a bit, but you don't have to look at it now because I hadn't 
Uh, we, we're going to get a little bit further in a moment before we, before we do it. But notice now, he, we, we have, well, let me do verse 7, and that will help us see it. Verse 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit how many things? All things, and I will be what? His God, he shall be my what? My son. It, I mean, it, right, he that overcometh. And so begin to study on that a bit. Overcome. How many times is it in the Bible? You know, I wonder what we consider or how we would define the meaning of being an overcomer. Have you ever had to overcome some things in your life? And every person here with any health issue, you know that's absolute truth. But have you ever had to overcome maybe, maybe a spiritual issue? I don't think in the modern church age we're very good at it. But I want you to know tonight there's one thing that you put a real star around, an asterisk or a circle or underline or put it in bold print, is how many times we're going to see God's admonition to us to be an overcomer. Think about it. Now, verse 8, and that handout I gave you deals with verses 6 through 8. So these three verses, and I think it's what? Is it six pages? Uh, on, on the handout for tonight. Now look at verse 8. But the fearful, hmm, and unbelieving, hmm, and the abominable, hmm, hmm, and the murderers, hmm, and the whoremongers, and the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the what? Second death. We know about that, don't we? We think about the lake of fire prepared to the devil and his angels. Now, if you look through this category of sin, it's catalog. What's the very first one? But the what? Right here, what is that? But the what? Does that even register with us? That being fearful could condemn us to the lake of fire? I think we sleep with it every day and every night. I don't know anybody who's ever come to me and said, Preacher, i got a problem. Now, I've had a lot of people come with different problems, and I've had a lot of problems that I've had to deal with. But I don't know of anybody whose alarm bell was going off and, and, and they were looking up and oh, preacher, I've done this terrible thing. What terrible thing? Well, I'm fearful. Oh, you'd be all right. Hey, I've got something here. My doctor gave me something one time that helped me with being fearful. I got something right in to help you. Isn't that where most people who are fearful to the point that interferes with how they live their lives end up? But you're laying down on me tonight. But if we're going to understand what it means to be an overcomer, we've got to understand the things that right off the bat we've got to be prepared to deal with. Why did God tell them that, listen, he, he, look, look back, verse 7, he that overcometh shall inherit how many things? Now, had we talked about that, the two sessions we met prior to, we're adopted into his family. We're joined as with Christ. You, you think about our position, but there's a little qualifier. If I'm to inherit all things with him, I got to deal with overcoming some stuff. And though I would say that out of our class tonight, those watching by the way of the web, 
I'd say that there's not many of us who lose any sleep over this first one. But the fearful. And then notice what he says after the fearful. He says, but the fearful and the what? Unbelieving. Mm. Now we've already done this in Hebrews 3rd chapter Hard not your heart is in today's provocation We've already learned that the Israelites That generation perished in the wilderness Because of unbelief We saw in Hebrews 4 verse 2 That when they heard the gospel And that's what is there Moses preached the gospel to them as to us We, we hear the gospel They heard the gospel But they didn't mix the gospel with faith and unbelief sealed their fate. And so I want to say it this way. You can count the rest of them on the list. We got the abominable, and boy, that's an interesting study. That's some mm, real perverted stuff. And murderers, whoremongers, akin to over here, sorcerers, witchcraft, pharmakia in the Greek, dispensing of drugs, idolaters, worshipers of things made, and then all what? Liars. And they're going to have their part in the lake with birth, fire, and brimstone, which is second death. But what's the first two on the list? Not the last two, the first two. Fearful and what? Unbelieving. And if if verse 7 is something that we need to really think about. He that overcomes. I want to say it this way. Brothers and sisters, on that list in front of us, the two things on that list that we should fear the most are the first two. are socially programmed against the abominable, against the murder, against the whole mongering, against the, sor the sorcery, the pharmakia, the idolatry, the lying. Socially, we're programmed by that. But when it comes to the fearful and unbelieving, we can hide that real well. And most of time, only we know. Only we know. Some on that list, people pray every day, God help me, help me with this. Help me with these thoughts. Help me with this battle I'm in. But I wonder how many go to sleep saying, God help me with my, I'm, I'm just fearful. Now you believe if we ask God to help us with our unbelief and being fearful that he would? Absolutely. would be in the family. Yeah. The fear of failure, I believe, is one of the greatest fears. Greatest fears. Ma'am, I think worry would really be the evidence that we are fearful. I mean, it would be a manifestation that, that that's gnawing on us. And there are many other ways that you can see it. But the reason I'm spending some time on this and hit it pretty heavy and hard is this. I don't know why I didn't link it more emphatically. But you see, my responsibility as a shepherd is to try to help the flock with the things that are the most difficult to deal with. And there's so many ways we can, we can hide it. And we, we put other labels on it. But at the end of the day, this is where, and, and that handout I gave you has got verse 8 in it. You're going to see more in depth in the handout. Uh, I think it's six pages, but you'll see verses 6, 7, and 8 dealt with. And... Uh, I believe as you as you get that open, let me let me stop just a moment. Let's let's maybe I should have 
and, and I didn't, let's see here, here it is, uh, here it is right here, let's see, here we go, let me make that, I can make that bigger, 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 okay, can you see that, is it better, I think so, now, we're in Revelation, chapter 21, verse 6 through 8, and uh, I don't know why I got some of that verse cut off. I know why I didn't get to the front of it. Here we go. Heaven and earth now. Look, believers, there will be the, uh, there will be the citizens of the new heaven and new earth. Note that God himself is speaking. And we've got to note that in text we're in. God himself is speaking. And then if you look, first thing I highlighted, the citizens of the new heaven and earth will be those who thirst for life. What does it mean, thirst for life? Well, if you look with me here, I've, th this is... There is a study that was done by a pastor who is totally anonymous. And he did it through the entire the whole Bible. No one knows him. I think, I think a friend told me, would not identify the man, but I believe he's from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And it took him 20 plus years. He did not copyright his study. It is from a series called The Preacher's Outline Study Bible. And it's something, what you're looking at right here is some of the best stuff I, I've got in my library is what this man did. And did not draw a royalty on it. It is published, they do sell the books. But from what I understand, the proceeds from the books goes to, goes to a mission that, uh, that he wanted the money to go to. And, and I learned that from someone who knew him that when he had a verse he couldn't figure it out he just walked the streets way in the night praying God you gotta help me you gotta help me show me show me where it, where it meets and look what he said look, look under that first point the citizens of the new heavens and earth will be those who thirst for life and then if you'll notice the thirst after life means that one thirst now look at this that one thirst look one to know the life that God wants man to live to know the life that God gives, to know the fullness of life that is in God himself, to know the hope of life that God has planned for man, to know the perfection of life that God longs for man to live. Hey, isn't that good? Then if you'll notice, simply stated, to thirst after life means to thirst after the life that God gives to thirst after God himself, and it means this, to know God, to fellowship, commune, and share with God. To know the salvation, forgiveness, and cleansing of God. To know the hope, the assurance, and the security of God. To live for God, to obey and follow God. And then the person who thirsts after God will be a citizen of the new heavens and earth. And then he goes to point two next. The citizen of the new heavens and earth will be the what? Overcomer. And it's there. So I wanted to give that to you, not knowing how much... How much time we might might have to um, let me let me back that thing just didn't want to do right tonight. Let's see right here. Let's see right. I did jump the whole page. Let's see what did it do? What did it do? Well, we might have to pray again. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. He ties in so many other Bible verses that we're going through here. Um, we're going to get to that eighth verse. It's where we, we're creeping along. I don't know why it's jumping so deep. I'm on page three now. You should be on the same page that I am. And if you're watching by way of the stream, I hope I don't get you seasick. But... Uh, Ah, that thing went to the end of the document. I've never done that before. All right, here we go. We get that's three. Let's go to two, two, two. Look at this right here. Here we go. The citizens. Now look at this. Uh, the new heaven and earth will be overcome. Easy. The overcome is the person who overcomes the world and, and remains faithful and loyal to Christ. It means the person who remains pure and follows the Lord Jesus Christ. The overcome is the person who conquers all the temptations and trials of life. Two great promises are made to the overcomer. Number one, 
he will inherit all things and all and, and all the new heavens and earth all that that offers he will be a son of god and then you got to quote john 1 12 that uh, as many received him unto them become the sons of god that's that's the bene elohim and then we have romans 8 14 through 7 that's adoption we've done it and then also you got the heirs in Galatians 4, 7. And then you also have that ye be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's Philippians 2, 15. And then also we have the next quote, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's 1 John 1, 3. Now, the third point that he makes, the, the rejection and fate of the people who, uh, who will be rejected are clearly spelled out. What is, you know, what, what a tragic list it is. And here's that first point. The fearful are cowardly. Those who do not confess Christ because they fear what others may say. Those who are afraid to give up the world and deny self those who fear taking a stand for Christ, those who fear the fellowship or become identified with Christian people. So th this, this is, again, a take on this matter of, of being fearful. And uh, again, I don't know that that bothers a lot of people. And then you've got quotes from Matthew 10, 32, where he says that he'll confess us before men if we confess him. Uh, I mean, we confess him before men, and then he'll confess us before the Father in heaven. And then if you'll look with me, we're getting to the unbelieving. Uh, that's, that's this uh, bullet right here. The unbelieving, those who do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, those who reject Jesus Christ, his death and the cross for their sins, those who profess Christ but live hypocritical lives, who, who show uh, by their sinful behavior that they do not really believe him. So he's dealing with a matter of unbelief. And then if you go with me to page 3, we're going we're gonna to continue our, our little journey here. He's going to deal with the matter of those who reject him. And uh, let's go a little bit further because I did plan to go through the entire handout because I, that's why I gave it to you. I wanted to stop right here. Um, whosoever, you see the text on hating your brothers like a murderer. And then this next bullet, the whoremonger, are immoral, those who are sexually impure, those who commit fornication or have sex for marriage, those who commit adultery and homosexuality, and all other sexual acts that God forbids, those who look and lust, uh, read and lust, think and lust, and so he, he, he has, you know, driven a stake down pretty, pretty deep right here. And uh, then he goes to the, the scriptures to supplement uh, what he has said. You've heard that it was said by them of, of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. So he, he, he's just outlining from various sources the uh, just the temptations uh, the sorcerers those who engage in astrology or witchcraft devil worship spiritism seances palm reading fortune telling and all the forms of false belief that claim to reveal and control one's fate life and destiny and uh, it, it's somewhat shocking to learn the number of people who as you might do your daily devotion uh, their daily devotion is, is the getting a horoscope and to see what kind of day they're going to have. And that's from top to bottom in society. I mean, there's some people that the horoscope doesn't read right, they won't fly that day. Uh, and and uh, so we have to be careful about these things. Then he goes to idolaters. Those who worship idols, whether idols made with one's hands or just conceived in one's mind, those who have an image of what God is like and worship and follow that image instead of following the God revealed by the scriptures, those who put the things of, of this earth before God, 
those who uh, give their, their primary attention and devotion to someone or something other than God. Now, I felt like when I saw this, boy, he really put a fence around it because I think that people have the idea because we've seen movies and, 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 and other forms where people might be idol, you know, worshipers of idols. And people say, well, I don't bow to an idol. It's not the act as much as it is how much of your heart is captured by it. Uh, if we love anything more than we love God and the things of God, that's where the problem is. And uh, we, we, need to, we need to understand it. Now, what you signed up for in this ABI class is exactly what we're doing tonight. I mean, some of this, it'd be virtually, I won't say impossible to, I could not do on Sunday morning any in-depth study that we're doing now. It would be almost, almost off the page. But the people on Sunday mornings are the ones who need to hear this. Our society is totally done flip-flop. Right is made wrong. Wrong is made right. Things that at one point in time were identified as sin are now identified as being a sickness. And that's from alcohol on. And, and, and one thing that I've, I've marveled at, and this is, there, there are too many theologians, too many pastors who are winking at the rewriting of our morality laws and, uh, and, and don't take this into consideration. Did we not read a moment ago that if you look, if a man looks for a woman to lust after her, that in his heart he's committed adultery? Lust, and I mentioned this, I guess, Sunday night, lust led to the downfall of the fallen angels. They uh, looked upon the daughters of men and wanted them. And rebelled against God's word. And left their position in heaven. With God. Knowing. Knowing they could get it back. In, in revising or revisiting. No revising. Reversing. Not revising. Reversing Herman. Uh, Heiser deals with that. Not in depth. But in the book of Enoch, it, he, in, in Enoch it goes into detail about uh, the rebellion, the ones that led it, the ones that, I mean, they made a cut, 200 of them, fallen angels made a covenant together so one would have to stand alone in their rebellion. And then I guess it's like buyer's remorse whenever they, they had committed their sin. Then they went to Enoch and asked Enoch to go to God and asked God to forgive them, that they were sorry. And so they pleaded with Enoch. Enoch goes and pleads with God that they might be forgiven. And God's answer was, no, no, no. Our best day has been that of a believer. Saved by grace, with a new nature, but still embodied in the old nature. You see, in this life, an unsaved person only has one nature, and that's the unsaved nature of the old nature. A believer, upon salvation, has a new nature. In that new nature, we worship God. In our old nature, we worship the flesh. And these two are contrary to each other. We, 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 we talked about that. I confused my days. Was it Sunday or Sunday night? Uh, but in Galatians, the fifth chapter, it was Sunday night because I did with the fruit of the Spirit. But if you get in Galatians chapter 5, start verse 19, he talks about the works of the flesh. A manifest which are these. He starts out with the first four sex sins. And then he deals with the others. 
And I mean, that, I mean, Galatians 5, beginning of verse 19, covers it all. And, and, uh, and then he says how these, the, the spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh against the spirit, so that you can't do the things you would. James says it. You get in verse 5, 6, 7. James says, uh, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. To be double-minded is to be living in the flesh, satisfying the lust of the flesh, and also to try to walk in the Spirit. The Lord said you can't do both. You can't serve mammon, and you can't serve God at the same time. Now, whichever we feed the most, exercise the most, is the strongest. Is that, does that make any sense to you? I mean, if you neglect, if all you ever get is an occasional Sunday morning sermon, and, and you know, not daily Bible reading, not memories, raise the scripture, not good Christian fellowship, maybe not even a good diet, a good gospel of music, and all you get is just a good devotion on Sunday morning or whatever, and then you want to be out at twelve. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to run over and into eating a K and W or whatever. And so we kind of compartmentalize God into this small framework. And God says, no, 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 no. I want all of you. All of you. And I'm afraid in our day, we got a problem there. And that's why we need to understand the scriptural basis on being an overcomer. We also need to have an understanding of how the flesh works. You can't, you can't, uh, I do it all the time. And I'm late, and I do thank you, Joe, and that was good pie. She brought me some sugar-free pineapple pie. And here with the different things going on, birthdays and my birthday and all this stuff. I can walk by it in the kitchen and I can cut my eye over and see that cake. And I bet that's good. I resisted it after lunch because I ate enough. But then I keep looking and that cake will say, come over here. Take that cake lid plate off. Take, look, at, look at me. And before long I find I got a knife in my hand. And I cut a real thin slice. And it's so good, I said, I better cut another one see what's wrong with it. And before long, I can mess up. And, and, and I've got all the intentions of not doing it. Now, where did my problem start? The lust of the eyes when I looked at it. And then I looked at it again. And before long, you then have committed. That sin goes from here to your hand to your mouth. So as we look at this, we have to begin to understand there's a process. And how do we become overcomers? That, that's that's the, the study tonight. How important is it? Is it relevant? And I believe that you're going you're gonna to agree before we finish, and I think this is, that's just on the second, third page. Let's, let's change gears a little bit. I've got the handout. You can go through it. And uh, now, if you get upset with somebody, I can't tell you the preacher's name because he's anonymous. But if you're going to get mad with somebody, get mad with him. Because he, he, wrote, he wrote the study guide. But now, Let's, let's go somewhere else. Now, I was in Revelation 21, and we got down, I believe, to verse 8. Now, I want to close this, and I want to do another, another stop, and this will put us right here. Now, how are we fixed on time? Are we good? We go. while, while we're getting ready to, to do this, this is just... We're going to look at this matter of being an overcomer and uh, share, share with you several, several stops on the way. In the study we just looked at in Revelation 
21. You'll see it again in 20. Um, what do you suppose life was like before Lucifer led the rebellion and uh, sought to overthrow God? Before the war in heaven, some, some commentators refer to it as a war in heaven. Well, what, what do you suppose it was like? Well, Heiser is of the opinion, and you'll see it in the book. Um, and if you go through the table of contents, you can probably find a study guide too. But he's of the opinion that uh, everybody lived together. God's family. Everybody lived together. I mean, the, the, these angels who we now identify as fallen angels were holy angels. But everybody, everybody was in one, you know, kind of one place. And then whenever the sin occurred, they were not cast out of heaven. That doesn't happen yet. And I have a lot of people who will ask and inquire and say, well, why did God allow it? And I can't give you the answer. I don't know. But we do know we did it last week, the week before, I think. Didn't we go to Job, first chapter last Tuesday night? Then we revert chapters one and two and later, where you got God with the sons of God, and then Satan comes up. And then the, the question about Job the Lord asked him, said, have you considered him servant of Job and, 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 and Lucifer? Satan says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he loves you, but it's because you bless him. Take, his, take your blessings away, he'll curse you to your face. He says it both in chapter 1 and 2, both chapters of Job. And so up until the fall, and I can't, I can't answer that. I don't have the answer yet. Now, maybe it's there I had not seen it. But God, I guess we just have to say he's long-suffering to put up with it. I sure am glad he put up with me. Aren't you glad he put up with you? I mean, that's a lesson about God, our, our relationship to him. Now, I think as we do this, this study, and what I want to point out this time is with every... Every uh, occurrence of overcoming, uh, there's a reward. I want you to look at that. Now we're going to start in John 16, verse 33. And these are the words of Christ. If you got read other Bible, these are in red. And the Lord's speaking to what he says. These things I have spoken unto you that in me, you might have what's the word? Peace. Now, I contend, I contend that there's no real peace other than that. I, I contend that if you want peace, that peace is going to be in him. He says, these things I have spoken unto you. So they should be being reminded that in me you, have, you, you might have peace. Now, look what that, he says next. In the world, you shall have what's this word? Tribulation. So anybody been through some stuff? Well, where does tribulation come from? It comes from the world. Now, a lot of times people blame God. But God is a giver of peace, not tribulation. I mean, it could be a death, an accident, things happen, and, 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 and people want to get mad well, God let it happen. Now, the, the reason each of us have the course in life that we're on goes back to the problem Adam presented to us when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden and sin got in our DNA. You see, nobody had to teach us how to sin. It was passed to us from Adam all the way back to the Garden of Eden. But yet sometimes we get all confused and Satan loves to mess with us. See, last week we spent a lot of time in second, Thessalonians, the second chapter, where we saw how, he, how deceitful he is. And, and uh, then Sunday, uh, based part of the message that came out of the Tuesday night study on delusion. 
Say for those that God gave them the strong delusion that they believed the lie that they wouldn't be saved. And so we kind of have to put some things in perspective. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Now, when we study the overcoming part, that's the byproduct. I mean, that's, it comes with it. You don't have to pay extra for it. It's a part of salvation. It's what happens. The world can't give it to you. I mean, the world might give you a momentary, be like having hiccups. You, know, you may have a momentary moment, but then it's going to fade away. It's like riding a roller coaster. You can have a thrill, and you can have a high, and you can have a low. But you always get back where you got on, and then you got to pay the ride again. There's nothing, not, Satan doesn't give you anything free. And then notice this last phrase. He says, I have overcome what? The world. So why, why would we not want to get just as close to him as we can and have him show us how to overcome the world? You ever heard the saying it's hard to tell somebody something when they think they know everything? Man, I don't know how we got that indoctrination in the church. But we have a lot of folks. You can mention a sermon topic. Now, see, I've heard that. I've heard that. I don't need it. I've heard it. Mm -mm. No, every day is a new day. Now go with me just a little bit further. First John chapter 2, verse 13, 14 gives us a recipe. Here's a recipe. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. Now you've got to understand John. John wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He wrote God, John wrote Revelation. John leaned over on the Lord's chest at the Last Supper. The youngest disciple, John, was told by Jesus from the cross, take care of my mother. Do you think John knew Jesus? Absolutely. And notice what John is saying. I write unto you, Father, he's talking fathers. This is older generation. You have known him that is from the beginning. So in the beginning would have been Bethlehem or his ministry at baptism, I write unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. And I, I look at that, you know, that's interesting, that he identified the older men, he says, uh, the, the fathers, you, you know because you've been around the longest, and then you younger guys, he said, because he, the young men, because you've overcome the wicked one, I write unto you little children because you have known the father. And I suppose in that childish stage, when I was saved, I, was, I started out as a babe. And then I grew a little more and became a child. My relationship with my father was much more intimate when I was a baby and a child than when I was a teenager. When I got to be a teenager, I, you know, that, that, the, that hugging part and daddy holding me down and texting me and all those sort of things that he did when I was little wasn't the same thing. And so here you got a, a model in spiritual growth, I believe. So the children, he says, I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. That's an intimate relationship, I believe, the babe Christ has with the Lord upon salvation. Now, let's go with me. In verse 14, uh, he, he says, this is chapter 2, verse 14. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is... Wait a minute, that didn't work good. Probably because you... Uh, oh, here we did. Let's go back. 13, it reads almost the same. And then 14. Uh, I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and that clears it. And you have overcome the wicked one... And then 
uh, and, and you're going to jump over to chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Uh, look at this with me, because here we get into a defining of what we looked at in chapter 2. He says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. So it starts out with spiritual birth. If we're all on that page, you know, I'd hit a little bit. All right, now, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our what's the word? Faith. Now, how big is faith? You remember those warnings we had in Revelation 1 8, 21 8? He says, But the fearful and unbelieving. And here he's pointing out, and this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And then you got you to gotta see, I hope Roman, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Uh, well, not 17. Faith come to hear and hear the word of God. So, faith, third, fourth. What about verse 14? Uh, you got, as we read God's Word, our faith will grow. I would say this tonight. If you've been involved in ABI just the three weeks, and that's led you to look, for, look at verses in your Bible that maybe you hadn't seen before, or you pray God, God give you some clarity, already your faith is growing. The Word of God grows our faith. And, and, and then in verse 5, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is what? Son of God. Now what is that big? That you believe Jesus is the Son of God. You remember a little bit ago we talked about what it must have been like before the angels fell and, and, and uh, led to all the commotion that was in heaven. And, and uh, how man had a relationship with God, the Garden of Eden, before man sinned. And then that sin interrupted that fellowship. And that had to be restored by the sacrificing of, of um, two sheep, one for Adam, one for Eve, and that was restored. And then Adam and Eve could have fellowship with God. I mentioned earlier, I'm looking at the number of times in the Bible where we see God having a personal conversation with man either the angel of God or, or God himself who's at the burning bush uh, I believe it was God but some references are the angel of God and so but it, it's a, it, it's a, the personification on earth of a deity uh, Abraham at the whenever he walked the blood path and that was a vow that he made and and, and God walked with him in fact, God walked for him in Genesis chapter 15. There's that relationship. Moses was told, uh, you can't, God said, don't look at me. You can look at my backside, but you can't see me. Same thing Abraham had in the 15th chapter of Genesis. And there are other occasions where I believe, I believe Jesus was the fourth man in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I, I believe the heavenly host, whoever, went to check Sodom and Gomorrah out. And uh, we know there were angels. Abraham talked to them and pleaded that God would go from 50 righteous down to, you know, the minimum number. So we can see over and over and over, God, we got that relationship with God. And, and I believe we did this Sunday night. If we look in the Scriptures and see where others have had this intimacy with God, and the Bible teaches us that God's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever. God can't change. And God's not a respect of persons. Then can we have these relationships? And if we can't, why? Is it because we're fearful or unbelieving? Tonight has been the quietest you have ever been in Bible study. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna believe that you're thinking that that we're we're stirring a bit. Now go to verse seven, that chapter, same chapter. Wait a minute, no 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 first John four and five now now no chapter two in Revelation. Uh, we're going to verse seven. Now note this. Now note here's where the promises start. The Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that, what's the next word? 
overcome it. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Mm -hmm. And will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God? Now what do I need to do? Well, I can overcome if I claim 1 John 5, 4 and 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, so I'm saved. That's my first qualifier. And then the victor that overcometh the world, even our faith. And then who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Is that within reach for all of us? Absolutely. And so here, can we all get to the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God? Who's that for? Can you say us? You see, what, what will life be like? Well, in Revelation, we study and learn a lot about judgments. But we also have a lot of rewards. And I'm afraid the judgment sometimes overshadows the picture of the rewards. The judgment Satan will use to scare people away from Revelation. So if you never study Revelation... You don't know about this promise that's here. And who is it to? It's to those who overcome. Now go with me please. Revelation 2 verse 11. Same, same chapter. And if you'll note this is to the seven churches. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Now he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt. Of the what? The second death. What is the second death? Can you say the lake of fire? Okay, isn't that a pretty good insurance policy? Now, if you back up, we, got, we get to drink from the tree of life. We drink the tree of life, what does that mean? Exactly. Exactly, because that's why Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden was if they had if they had eaten the fruit from the tree of life, they would have been doomed forever, and we too, without salvation. And so that's why they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, and it was protected. Now we see that, that we have this promise in being an overcomer, you get the tree of life, and then also the second death, verse 11. Look at verse 17, same chapter. He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, this is the third time we've done this. How do all these verses tend to start out? He that hath what? An ear. You think God's trying to tell us something? And notice he is to the churches again. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of thee. And I've got three you see the first time, second time, third time. And I probably need some help. And I guess Walter and Joe, they've been in the class the longest. And so they probably can help me with this. But look at this with me. What is he saying? To him that overcometh. We've already studied that. We know our faith. We know how it works. Will I give to eat of one hidden manna? Notice next with me. And will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. What does that mean? <laughs> That's a good one to answer, Paul. <laughs> Other than that, I can say, well, we just got to wait we get there to see. Because <laughs> I've read a lot of people with commentaries. A lot of people have had ideas here. I really. Hidden manna. And, and then the white stone. And then we, we see that we got a new name. So the white stone really goes A and B. You got in the stone a new name. And then notice, which no man knoweth saving he that receives it. All I can say is, it's good. It's good. We won't have to go to the customer service department and ask for a refund or a return. We will rejoice in it. Now let's go a little bit further. Second chapter, verse 26. 
And he that overcometh, did have he that hath an ear here now, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over what? Over the nations. Now you remember a few weeks ago, maybe a year or so ago, when I first began this study, I talked about us replacing the angels that fall. Not all the angels but those that fall. So we have a pretty bright future. This verse, I had not really, well, read it slow enough. This verse says, to him will I give power over the what? The nations. Now what do we know, what do we now know about our future and our future in eternity. If we're over here on the map, now we're all we all fear. We are we're new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. So we're, we're all fear. So what are we going to be doing? What will some of us be doing? Those who are overcomers. He will give to those power. Over nations. How big is that? Number one, we can know that in our future there will be nations. Had you thought about that? I hadn't. I hadn't. I'll be honest, I hadn't. But I won't say it this way, I believe we got a bright future. I believe the best days to come. But there's a little qualifier sitting in front of this. Let's don't overlook qualifier. What's the qualifier? He that what? Overcometh. Is that big? Really makes us want to do some real inventories of our soul, isn't it? Make sure we don't have a little bit of temper. Make sure we don't get a bad attitude. You know, maybe we don't have our, our, our little green-eyed moment where we get a little envious. Or we won't believe cake alone is actually right. In fact, that might get me a good promotion if I can continue to do that. But think about it. I, don't you think that too many believers have an idea that when they get to heaven, all they're going to do is float on a cloud playing a harp? Or either they don't have a clue? I don't know. I don't know. Well, number one, if we are an overcomer, and boy, with that you got peace, you got all that the Lord offers. I mean, how, how could we not begin to live in the moment? In the moment. We're not there yet. But we can begin to imagine what it's going to be like our first day in heaven. Yes, Jim. I didn't quite catch the first part of the question. I know the last part had to do with power. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm glad you asked that. Because I'm working on that. It's not ready tonight, but you're going to see some things. Might do it before we leave. Might do it before we leave. Let me see how much time we got. I got enough, maybe. Because we're, we're, we're doing the overcoming, but you're going to see it in Revelation 21 22. I saw, yes. Yeah. He did. Keep to work. Yeah. Yeah. Work is just to love him. I mean, that's just part of what it is in, in, in our Christian walk. Uh, uh, it, it's not something that we would do like a... It, it's not putting us under, under the law. Uh, you see, he said it this way. If you love me, keep my commandments. So the love we have for him 
will dictate the manner of life that we live. And so for us, that's just going to be, you know, it should just be a piece of cake. Because we love him enough. Oh, you like that, didn't you? Well, all right, Walter, help me out of this. Uh, yeah. Oh, it is future. No, no, it's, it's future. It's totally heaven. Yeah, we're, we're, we're looking, we're looking at, at the reward at the end of the journey, uh, so to speak, here. We're going to get there. Surely that whole concept is so exciting, you could do a whole semester of study on the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. And, and what he has revealed to us in scripture about that. And I think in the context of Revelation 2 and 3, because I see the rapture in chapter 4. And Revelation 2 and 3 are, are descriptive in these seven churches of seven different time uh, our churches in different time zones. Like the first church at Ephesus was a type of first century church. Then you go through, you go through the dark ages, you go through, well prior to that you got the persecutions, and then you got the church at Philadelphia, which is the church of revival, and that would be like the Great Awakening, and then the Laodicean church, which is lukewarm. And, and many believe that's to be the end time church. Uh, but they do fit somewhat in my mind. You know, I was thinking in those terms of placement more so than these open promises. You see, he says, and he that overcometh. The prior verses, he says, he that hath an ear, let him, uh, you know, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, then to him. So you got a message to the churches. And then he speaks to the individual who's the overcomer. And then you have here in, in verse 26, he doesn't, he, you know, he doesn't start this out in the same tone that he did prior to. But then when you get to Revelation 3, verse 5, he says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Now we know that's, we know that's the redeemed. And then he says, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Now, in Revelation, we saw it recently in our study, the, the number of times the references are to the book of life. And he goes on to say, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now, when and where does this take place? I believe it's a judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne of judgment. And because here, the, the fact that we're going to be clothed in white raiment, again, that's the, the, the redeemed. And yet, there's some of the, the visions that people had that we see where they were also in white. And so it's not a cut and dried, this is where it's got to be sort of thing. But this is that fifth verse talks about being clothed in white and then we go to the 12th verse same chapter and he says him that overcometh will i make a pillar in the temple of my god well that's a lot like a couple of the verses we looked at prior to um this is following the church at philadelphia when he says, a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven uh, from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Now, when you look at this, you, well, I need more time to, you can do a whole study. 
the timing and placement. We know there will be the temple in Jerusalem, and that's the Lord's Prayer when we pray, uh, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be known earth. We know that's a millennium. That's his earthly reign. We know after the millennium, the heavens, new heaven, I mean, the, the heaven, the earth, uh, it's all destroyed, destroyed by fire. That's depicted right here, this fire judgment. And then we've got the new, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem that, that's going to come down. Now, we're going to see it in a moment, not tonight. Next week I'll do it. In, in Revelation 21 22, we're going to see some things that are interesting about what's in New Jerusalem and what's not. And that's going to be, that's going to be I hope, a blessing to see it, but interesting. And you're also going to go back to Jim's question a little bit ago about this power over the nations. Let me do that. Let me, how much time we got? How much time we got? All right, let's go. All right, let's go to verse 21. And, and uh, let, let's look at this for a bit. In verse 21, third chapter. And I want to get here especially. Now, this is Laodicean church. He says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my what? My throne. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. If you look in verse 21 and think about what he has said. Now, we know we're heirs and joint heirs of Christ. But whenever he says, I, hey, notice, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my Father's throne? What? What does that mean? How big is that? Well, go out there and start counting stars. I mean, go out there for a moment and realize as you look up into the heavens, wherever it may be, New Jerusalem coming down, out of God from heaven, you get up there and you look, and you say, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere up there is God's throne. And also, God's future throne, because the old one is going to be destroyed. New heaven, New earth, new Jerusalem. Everywhere Satan's ever been is going to be cleansed by fire. He makes all things new. And somewhere up there is his, his throne. And he says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Doesn't say how long. Doesn't get any other details. But I'm going to say it this way. If you get a better VIP invitation than that one, come tell me about it. Our future is just bright. But there's a little hinge that the door swings on. And that hinge is on one word. And that word is overcoming. He to him that overcometh. And then we also see in Revelation 17, verse 4. Look at this now. This is in tribulation now. 17, that's tribulation. Thee shall make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them. Now look at this. For he is Lord of lords, King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful and will be with him. I mean, you're talking about a bright day. I mean, it, 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 if you look at this, you get to see it from every angle. Now, in Revelation chapter 21, we read it a moment ago. Verse 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit how many things? All things, and I will be his God. He shall be what? My son. What a day. All right, I said I was going to do. Let me, let me, let me, if this will cooperate, we're going to close with this, because this is what we're going to, we're going to do next week, the Lord willing, and uh, I think I think if I've got enough. Oh yeah, it's going to be slow, but there's something that has puzzled me a long time, and 
I never really had taken the time to get into it and look in any depth. And, and I got this on my mind, and I did, and I want to share with you. I should have had this, this loaded, but I had so much I was afraid if I did, it might cause it to crash. But it's Revelation 21. We just did that verse. Now, I think, I think you can see it when I make this a little bigger. I hope you can. You see that? All right, now, we just looked at verse 7. Here's the fearful and unbelieving. Now, let's, let's go a little bit further. And we know, we know he's going to wipe all tears from that thing. went the wrong direction. Let's right, start it over again. It doesn't even want to move. All right, Satan. How did that happen? That can't happen. That can't happen. That thing jumped back to the 13th chapter. You don't believe there's spirits that are bad? Here we go. We'll do it right here. All right. We're in Revelation 21, 21. You got 12 foundations. You got the gates. Notice the gates. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every uh, several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, and it was transparent. And notice, what, here's that verse I was looking at a while ago. That I, didn't, I didn't want to beat the drum too loud because I'm going to do some of this next week. But I'm going to show it to you now because it would be awfully awkward to jump over it. And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Now we're talking about New Jerusalem. The city of go 1,500 miles in every direction like a cube. Verse 23, And the city had no need of the sun and neither the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did enlighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now I just jumped to... I should have gone. That should work. That's it. Maybe I got it going. Now I got it going. Okay. Now look at this. Look at this. Look at this. And verse 23 is where we saw the, the, the Lamb is the light out of it. Look at verse 24. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Now, notice something here. What does it mean, kings of the earth? There will be a new heaven. There will be a new Jerusalem. There will be a new earth. Now what we don't know is will there be a temple in the new earth? There will be none in Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. According to Revelation 21. And then look with me for a moment. And you got to see this. you got to see it. Now the kings, he states it. He talks about them bringing... Uh, and so you know that there's some government going on. That's the whole point of this. I mean, people want to, what's our position going to be? Well, he's going to talk about giving the power of nations. Did he not? And, and then we would be his kings and priests. Has he not? And since we don't know how to connect it, we just kind of let that go in one ear and out the other. But I'm just wanting to tell you, our future is bright. And it's all built around that overcomer. And then if you'll notice in verse 25, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Look in verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and honor to the, uh, to the nations into it. So you get nations again, you get kings again. Verse 27, look at this now. Look at this, it's going to bother you. And I'm going to let you do it for a week. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now some of you burn in the sawdust. It isn't what we read, it's what we didn't read. 
we know only those who will enter New Jerusalem are those whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. We know those who make a lie. Look at it. He says, worketh abomination or maketh a lie. Uh, and he says, uh, uh, they're not getting in. You don't know what to do with this, do you? You just don't know what to do with That's okay. We're going to give you another day or two to think about it. Now, look at chapter 22. And so here, here, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of it, the streets of it, either side of the river, was there a tree of life which bare twelve manners of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the, lo and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Verse 3 says, And there shall be no more curse, but the thrones of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. And then we're going to go down just a little bit more. And this will interest some of you. Now, you're going to see three times he's going to give us a message in red. These are the words of Christ. And uh, he says, Behold, I come quickly, blessed he to keep the saying of the prophecy of this book. And he says, And I, John, heard them when I heard them and seen them. Now, let's see again. Uh, okay, here we go, 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 here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Look at this. Now, what are we going to do with this? And he saith unto me, Seal not the saying to the prophets of this book. So he didn't seal it. For the time is at hand. He that is, what's the word? Unjust. Let him be, what? Unjust. He which is, what? Filthy. Let him do, what? Be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Now, I'm going to help you a little bit with this one. I'm going to let the other one soak a little bit. But now, look at this for a moment. He says, the whole will come quickly. The moment of his coming. There's no repentance. The unjust, the filthy, facing unjust, filthy. The righteous facing righteous. So what should that tell us? We better live looking up, hadn't we? Yep. If we live looking up, we got to worry about it. Now, let me help some of you. I've been, I've been stood on this a long time. Verse 14. He says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now, is that in heaven? Is that trivia? I mean, is that millennium? Is that eternity? Where, where is that? Because in, in my mind, I had things pre-programmed pre that we'd be almost like robots. But see, we got free will. You got to remember. And if we can't get our will tamed here, then we get trouble. But now look at this. Anybody seen verse 15? Do you see verse 15, Susan? All right, now look at this. For without are dogs and sorcerers and homongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. What does dogs have to do with all that? Well, I am happy to report that it does not have anything to do with a four-legged dog, but a two-legged dog. And actually, it's sodomites. And I did, a lot, I did a lot of book burning to get consensus and commentaries. And, and, and why it was translated that way, there's no real, real explanation for it. But in, but in, in, in the Greek here, it, it's not a four-legged dog. It would be more, and that's in line with those that are condemned as well. 
So next week we're going to look at some more things that I believe will be a blessing. And I'm sure we're out of time for a minute, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us grow in grace, freshly fill us with the Holy Spirit. Lord, there's so many ways I believe you're trying to tell us it's time to look up from the earthquakes to the volcanoes to the falling away the, just the evil the wickedness that is in our day. Lord, we got family and dear friends that we love and the world is so entangled and it's so easy in the flesh to get all tangled up in the world and people have better intentions they want to do differently. But they seemingly get trapped. The Lord last Sunday through one young man you breathed on him and a breath swept across our service. God, we know that in our best efforts, we're going to come up short. But we know if you breathe on us and you breathe on them, they'll find you irresistible and altogether lovely. And we believe they'll be saved. Help us, God. We give you glory. In Christ's name, amen. Well, thank you for your attention. It's just Brother Harvey.